Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Lens podcast, where we're viewing the animal experience. Today, I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Tiamat Duarte, and our very special guest, Gordon Mead. Gordon's a Scottish poet based in Fife and a Royal Literary Fund writing fellow. He's the author of numerous books, including Singing Seals, The Private Zoo, and most recently, Zoo Speak, which features the photography work of animal activist Joanne MacArthur. His current project is a new volume due later this year called Exposed Animal Allergies, which will also feature the powerful combination of Gordon's poems and the work of a number of photographers. Gordon also works devising creative writing courses for vulnerable young people in a variety of different settings. And um, we'll start by sending this over to Gordon. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your new book and what the experience of, of doing that work was? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Great introduction. It's, it was all I was going to say, really. Um, well, yeah, well, the zoo speak, if we talk about that first, um, that really came about when I uh, came across Joe's work, John MacArthur's work, in about 2016, initially from her first book, We Animals. And a couple of the images in that book uh, really spoke to me, but it wasn't until her next book, Captive, came out that I that I felt I had to really try and write a poetic response to some of the images there. And uh, it came about mostly just with me trolling through the book, uh, looking at the images, and whichever one really jumped out was the, the one I wrote about that particular day. And once I'd written about half a dozen of them, I felt that because of the just the form of them, that uh, they would need something else if I, if I was going to try and publish them as a book. And so I sent a few of them, maybe about a dozen, to Joanna MacArthur, and I was really lucky in the fact that she really enjoyed the poems, really liked them a lot, and gave me permission to use her work with the book, and that, that's how that book came about. The new one that we're at the stage of looking at proofs for just now uh, is called, as you mentioned, um, Exposed Animal Elegies. And the format, the, the, the sort of poems are very different, very, very sh much shorter than the, uh, the ones in Zoo Speak. But the similarity is that they'll be married with an image, uh, mostly by Joe, but by a few other photographers as well. And whereas Zoo Speak looks uh, only at captive animals, mostly in zoos, the new book will look at uh, the abuse of non-human animals in a variety of settings, including uh, factory farming, uh, the fishing industry, industrial fishing, uh, entertainment, fashion, etc. So it'll be, it'll be more wide ranging in that, in that sense. So uh, we can go ahead and look at one of the poems from your book so we can discuss the individual poems a little bit more. Um, so one of the ones that really stuck out to both me and Tiamat was the brown bear in Germany one on page 26 of Zoo Speak. We would love if you'd read that out for us. So for anyone who is just listening to the audio of this podcast, we can definitely we definitely recommend that you take a look at the video file as well because these images add a lot when you're listening to Gordon's poems. So Brown Bear, Germany, 2008. I'm aware of what you are, and I'm also aware of what you are thinking. You are a human being. I am aware of what you are, and I am also aware of what you are thinking. You are a human being, and you are thinking I am something else. I am aware of what you are, and I am also aware of what you are thinking. You are a human being, and you are thinking I am something else. Put here for your entertainment. I am aware of what you are, and I am also aware of what you are thinking. You are a human being, and you are thinking I am something else put here for your entertainment that makes it easier for you to ignore me. I am aware of what you are, and I am also aware of what you are thinking. You are a human being, and you are thinking I am something else 
put here for your entertainment. That makes it easier for you to ignore me and the wire mesh that surrounds me. I am aware of what you are, and I am also aware of what you are thinking. You are a human being, and you are thinking I am something else put here for your entertainment. That makes it easier for you to ignore me and the wire mesh that surrounds me, the wire mesh that separates us. I am aware of what you are, and I am also aware of what you are thinking. You are a human being, and you are thinking I am something else put here for your entertainment. That makes it easier for you to ignore me and the wire mesh that surrounds me, the wire mesh that separates us and your way of thinking from mine. Yeah, I think what really struck me about this one was that division drawn by the fence. When we initially look at a photograph, we're looking at it once as one person. But that Hmm. bear is seeing someone in that onlooker's role over and over and over. And I felt like the way you used repetition in the poem really drove home that ongoing, um, like repeated interaction, if you can call it as much, where the bear is seeing someone watching them and then seeing someone else watching them. So it was interesting to me the way that you continued to build on to that initial, I know what you are. And I guess my question is, did you find that that was an experience you were having as you continued returning to the photo? Like that that grew with you continuing to look at it? Yes, in some ways it did. I mean, yes. I mean, that's the the idea of, again, the the form really uh, proposed itself. Again, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to use repetition in these these poems, but uh, certainly because of the the theme, the idea of the the problems and the sort of mental issues that animals, non-human animals, can have in captivity, it seemed that the repetition was a a very good method of of trying to uh, express that. So uh, obviously, in different poems, you're saying different things because of the repetition. But in this one, I think probably you're right. It, it sort of it built it built on my own experience of viewing the creature, and the creature in some way looking back at me. The photograph you talk about the the, the wire mesh as being a sort of boundary. I think certainly for me when I was writing the poems, the photograph and the book itself became both an opening to their experiences, but also a, a boundary in a way for me a sort of safety valve because then I could I could close the book and then go back to the photograph or go back to a different photograph and I certainly was aware when I was writing the poems that the actual uh, subjects of the photographs didn't have that opportunity at all and that's where the sort of repetition again the sort of the relentlessness of of their existence uh, was important to me to try and to try and uh, explain express in some way yeah it came through beautifully for sure yeah well as i said most of the, most of the poems in zoo speak are from zoos but there are exceptions to that There's some from uh, fur farms uh, aquariums and this one is actually from a, a breeding facility for macaques macaque laos 2011 Am I still in shock, or am I by now in mourning, or am I just sitting, waiting for the body? Am I still in shock, or am I by now in mourning, or am I just sitting, waiting for the body of the dead to be taken away? Am I still in shock? Or am I by now in mourning? Or am I just sitting, waiting for the body of the dead to be taken away from me? I am holding myself. 
am I still in shock? Or am I by now in mourning? Or am I just sitting, waiting for the body of the dead to be taken away from me? I am holding myself closely as there is no one else here. Am I still in shock? Or am I by now in mourning? Or am I just sitting, waiting for the body of the dead to be taken away from me? I am holding myself closely as there is no one else here who is either willing or able to do it. Am I still in shock? Or am I by now in mourning? Or am I just sitting, waiting for the body of the dead to be taken away from me? I am holding myself closely as there is no one else here who is either willing or able to do it for me. This is what death looks like. Am I still in shock? Or am I by now in mourning? Or am I just sitting, waiting for the body of the dead to be taken away from me? I am holding myself closely as there is no one else here who is either willing or able to do it for me. This is what death looks like in a cage at a breeding facility in Laos. I found that one to be <clears throat> of the ones that you had um, sent us to be the one that impacted me the most. How, how does that impact your own emotional well-being, I guess, or how do you manage that if you're looking at images for quite a long time or, or does it at all? I don't want to assume anything. Um, I'm, I'm curious about that aspect of, of this process because it's, it really is that um, looking at sifting through many images, I'm assuming that you might not use, and then also looking at one for longer periods and, and reflecting deeply about it. I'm curious about yeah, that. Yeah, that's a good question. As I, as I said to Re Rebecca earlier, the, the book itself, very physical, very huge physical <laughs> object. And uh, in some ways it was, as I say, it was a way of, it was a way of opening myself up to the image, but also a way of it being contained in some way, uh, either in the book itself or even in, even in some of the photographs, because the photograph in this particular uh, poem the confines of the photograph almost accentuate the fact that this uh, macaque is on its own, whereas there are there were other photographs of similar scenes in that breeding uh, facility that Joe had taken. That the, the the camera was further back, and you could actually see that in some way this 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 was happening in the corner of a cage that had many macaques in it. And in some ways that, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, it did have an impact on me emotionally, obviously, but I'd rather, I'd rather not avoid the question, but my, my, my main uh, concern really is, is for people like Joanne MacArthur, who are there and actually seeing these things face to face. Any activists, any of these photographers uh, are visiting slaughterhouses, they're visiting breeding facilities, they're, they're seeing the animals very much face to face and how, how they can cope with that emotionally, I find amazing. Whereas for me, in the end, all they were were photographs. They were very striking images, but, I had that. Uh, I had that opportunity or that safety valve. That I could just say, "Right, I've had enough for today. <laughs> Close the book." And that's sometimes I think you have to do that. Yeah, it's it's interesting actually that you brought up the zoning in almost on those two and that that moment that was happening, um, or many moments I'm assuming, but that the moment snapped in that photo because when I when I looked at it at first, I also was wondering how many other macaques are in that cage, but it yeah. really gives you that feeling of just those two in the world and that's no one else exists really. I mean, I think in the, in the photograph and the poem tries to sort of 
mirror that, that although the, this macaque was indeed in a cage with many others, death and, and grief does actually put, some, put you in a, in a very much an isolated situation, I think. And uh, I think the photograph does, shows that very well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that's what really struck me about it. And I don't know that I would have really thought about the space outside of that corner if you hadn't mentioned that because the photograph really does narrow you in on that experience of loneliness. I think, like you just said, that kind of prompted something for me, what you said about how that is a moment captured for them. And of course, we know that that exact moment isn't still occurring, but in a way it's it's captured forever. And I liked the way that you used the present tense, am I still? That, yeah. that for me really drove home that while that moment is still not, is not still occurring, those moments are. And mm-hmm. I think that that was really impactful the way that it's, it shows the ongoing nature of the suffering that you're trying to capture. And I guess my question is, Was that something you were hoping to represent? I know you've said that you kind of let the poems grow with the feedback Mm -hmm. of the photos, but I guess I'm curious if representing the experience of the animals was one of those motivating factors for you going into this project. Yes, definitely, definitely it was. I didn't know how how they would come out. Definitely that was an intention. And... uh, Certainly, the the use of both the, you mentioned the present tense, uh, using the first person, and the repetition they were all they were all techniques to try and make more of an impact. So you're not looking at something that did happen in the past in that way. You're looking at something that is happening here and now, and uh, I think that uh, that that goes well with with the photographs as as you've mentioned. Just a snapshot. But it's almost as if that, once it's taken, that image is there for all time. And the idea of you, of using the present tense is just to keep that, almost to keep that going. But it's something that you can enter and, and experience in the here and now, rather than if the poem had been in the, in the past tense. That would have given a distance, I think, between between the reader and the poem that doesn't really need to be there in, in this particular case. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because photographs do tend to have that inherent past tense about them. So I feel like the way the poem was done in present tense kind of bridged that, made it feel more real, less possible to dismiss as something that used to happen, which we just love doing as humans. Most of the, the creatures in these photographs will probably be dead by now. Uh, and I was aware of that, and it was trying to trying to give them some sort of way of of giving a voice to to their lives uh, and, the, and the sort of lives they they, they had to uh, they had to live because of the, the captivity they found themselves in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Denmark, 2016. Don't I just take an amazing snapshot? One eye, one ear. Don't I just take an amazing snapshot? One eye, one ear, and very little else. Don't I just take an amazing snapshot? One eye, one ear, and very little else apart from the darkness. Don't I just take an amazing snapshot? One eye, one ear, and very little else, apart from the darkness that is my cage. Don't I just take an amazing snapshot? One eye, one ear, and very little else, apart from the darkness that is my cage. I have nothing to say. Don't I just take an amazing snapshot, one eye, one ear, and very little else, apart from the darkness that is my cage. 
I have nothing to say. My lips are sealed. Don't I just take an amazing snapshot? One eye, one ear, and very little else, apart from the darkness that is my cage. I have nothing to say. My lips are sealed. I speak volume. Such a, a gorgeous photo as well in that one. Yeah. Really is like, my... as the first line says, it really is a, a gorgeous snapshot. I mean, we have the cliche sort of the, being the voice for the voiceless, but I was more curious about um, whether anything in the imagery, the image itself brought that forth. Was it sort of something acting as, as a barrier over the lynx, lynx's um, muzzle? Was that something that conjured that up was it more of a visual thing or was it more of a symbolic or more of a you know um a linguistic barrier between lynxes and, and humans um or i was curious which approach you took there a bit of both really obviously because i mean I, again i think it is just without the context it's an amazing amazing photograph it's one of, one of my favorite photographs in, in the collection but obviously in the photograph you can't see the lynx's mouth all you see is the eye and the ear. So it's, it's like it's being forced to, to just view things or listen to things. Uh, the vocal side of it's taken away. So there's that. And in, it's funny because in, in certain myths, lynxes are uh, animals or mythological beasts that don't actually speak. They don't, they're, they're very silent creatures. So they're seen in mythology. And that, I was aware of that. And then obviously, again, my lips are sealed, I speak volumes. It's the idea of a, you know, uh, it's a photograph paints a thousand words. It's that, that's that sort of idea as well. Ah, okay, yeah. So there's lots of things going on in it, so yeah, yeah. Well, the, the mythology is interesting. I don't know, <laughs> I'd love to hear more about that, but um, was that something that you knew of as you were writing the poem or did that come up? later. I'd known about that for quite a while and it's funny again how you sort of carry ideas in your head and I write quite a lot about animals and I've always wanted to write a poem about a lynx <laughs> but there's no lynx in Scotland and uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't seen one and it's, it was a, it, in some ways it was unfortunate that the lynx that came to me was just happened to be this one uh, which find itself in, in a zoo. But uh, yeah, it, again, it was, it's funny because this, the point, this point for me, just because of the start of it, the first three lines, don't I just take an amazing snapshot, one eye, one ear. It, when I was writing it, it sounded, it sounded a, a lighter poem than some of the rest, you know, and I was, I was aware of that when I was writing it and I really had to go with that idea. And it was really only towards the end that, uh, for me, it became a bit darker, a bit more more serious. Uh, yeah, I, thought I enjoyed writing that one. Yeah, I actually quite liked how it started out seeming lighter, but of course wasn't because I feel like certain more charismatic fauna, like a lynx, like other big cats, they tend to, on the surface, be cute and it's it gives us warm and fuzzy and it is a gorgeous photo my my eyes immediately go to that adorable little ear tuft that lynx have and it just just melt and it takes a second to see past oh look at the kitty and get to everything else and i think that the poem kind of walked through that process in a really great way um but as you said that you don't have links in your area that made me um, made me wonder, in your experience of writing these, have you had the opportunity to be face to face across a zoo barrier with any of the animals that you've written about? And do you think that experience was very different from the photographs? Right. Well, I mean, I haven't been to a zoo for a long time. <laughs> to be honest, when, uh, when our daughter was young, we used to take her to Edinburgh Zoo. Um, because it was an opportunity for her to see animals that she wouldn't have the opportunity to see in the flesh, as you like. So 
there may have been obviously there may there would be residual memories and and emotions from seeing these animals then there was in particular at that time I don't think it's still there but there was a polar bear uh, in Edinburgh Zoo which seemed just ridiculous and it was a very small enclosure with uh, a bit of water that you could dive into and the whiteness of the snow was was either either plastic or stone I can't remember which and it was just a ridiculous situation for it to find itself in and I certainly think that that memory came back to me when I was writing the polar bear poem for this collection because they're uh, the way they were standing was quite similar uh, in the photograph the bears it's almost it's standing up and its arms are are forward almost in a sort of beseeching or praying mode and I remember the one from Edinburgh was, was similar to that uh, so yeah there's been there's been connections uh, in animals that I'd seen in the past that uh, yeah came with with the, the photographs brought those memories back so one of the more general questions I actually had for you, um, it was about how you feel your poems represent the individual versus the species. Um, and I think that ties in a lot with what you were saying about taking your daughter to the zoo and giving her that chance to be face to face with creatures she wouldn't have that opportunity to. And I personally credit my love for animals with having those experiences and at the same time sit with a guilt in my in my guts about being kissed by a sea lion and petting a beluga and at a facility local to me that we won't mention. Um, but I think that there's definitely a lot to be said about trying to get their experience out beyond just look, touch, novelty and I guess I'm wondering how you how you feel your work is with regards to the individual versus its role as an ambassador for a species. That's yeah, that's difficult because I think when I was actually writing, when I was actually writing the poems, when I'm writing when I was writing the poems for the for the new book as well, I certainly did try in most of the cases to see the creatures in the photographs as individuals, uh, just in the same way that, that all I am, I am an individual uh, writing my sort of poem, hopefully trying to uh, get inside the individual in the photograph. So the actual process of the writing is a very individualistic thing in bo on both sides. I think once the poem then is published in a book, that becomes more difficult because I think they probably are seen as then as representatives, which they are in a way, in the same way as that, that one macaque was representative of the many. There were many macaques in that cage. There are, there were other macaques mourning uh, their fellow prisoners, if you like, that died or were injured. Um, so I think the, the I think the impact of poetry of this sort of poetry is far better if if people, both the both the poet and the the reader, can in some way see the creature as an individual. And that maybe was one of the reasons I, I was using the first person in these poems. It's an I talking all the time. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think any interaction we have with an individual, even through photography, is so individual. Um, and I wonder, with regards to how readers are interpreting your poems versus those who get the opportunity to hear you read them out. Do you think that the impact or the interpretation would be different? Do you think they would maybe individualize that experience a little bit or? I don't know. It's, I, mean, I, I, I do feel, I, I feel that all, all poetry is, is better heard than, than read from the page. I think it gives, it gives it a lot more 
impact in that way. It's certainly a diff very different way of experiencing it. Um, reading it on the page, obviously, you have more time to go back over it and things like that. But uh, I think if poems are, are, are read well, um, it's a lot better to hear them rather than just, just read them from the page in that way. It sort of forces you to, th I think it forces you because there's a, there's a time constraint to the, to the performance. Maybe it, it sort of encourages the, uh, the audience to, uh, I don't know, to concentrate maybe a bit more because it's, it's, it's more of a fleeting experience than if you're actually reading it from, from the pages of a book, if that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense, actually, because when I was reading them, I was enjoying them, but hearing you read them out loud, especially as the, the person who wrote them, um, it was an entirely different experience because you have your, your, your intonation, you have the way that you're expressing the emotion perhaps that you, you felt when you wrote it, um, in addition to that focus. Because I think especially with that, rep the repetitive nature of the poems, um, just with my, <laughs> the way my attention goes, that I'm sort of jotting along and kind of looking at all, everything at once in a way. And um, it, it's much better to just have someone just sit me down, <laughs> read me the poem and I'm, I'm listening to it. Um, so for me, I, I feel like I took them in much differently hearing you, um, you read them. And I was actually curious how you got into this, how you got into, and I know that you're working with, um, as Rebecca mentioned in the intro, that you you teach this in a way uh, you're working with um, with youth. Um, how did you get into writing poetry, and how did you specifically sort of move into this this area, this area of poetry, looking at individuals of other species and, and presenting them in that way? Yeah, well, I mean, how I got into writing is is. is <laughs> It's interesting, my, my sister uh, was an actress and uh, was about eight years older than me. And when she was about 16, 17, she would, uh, when she was learning her lines, I'd have the, the, the book of the play and I, I was like a prompt. So I would listen to her and I'd, I'd be able to say maybe, two or three words if she, she got wrong, just to sort of try and help. And uh, I wanted to be an actor, but I don't have the memory. <laughs> I don't have the memory for it. Uh, I wouldn't be able to remember speeches and things like that. But, but that was my, my introduction to language was through my sister Shakespeare sometimes. And when she was doing her, uh, her English A-levels, uh, over here, she was looking at uh, sort of war poets like Wilfred Owen, and she would read me poems by them. And I, it was just, and fun, funnily, it was it was her voice and her the rhythm of her voice and the rhythm of the the poets really really got me interested in it. And that's probably why I started certainly being interested in poetry. I started writing it seriously. Uh, because of an accident I had actually down in London. I was uh, coming back from a, a film, I think it was, on a double-decker bus. They used to be open-ended double-decker buses. And that time I uh, smoked. So I was standing at the, on the back of the, the bus. My stop was coming up. And I had one hand in my pocket looking for my cigarettes and the other hand in my other pocket looking for my lighter. And the bus came up to a zebra crossing and this woman was going to cross the road. So the bus slowed down and then she changed her mind and waved it on. And uh, <laughs> the bus shot off and I shot off the, <laughs> the back of the bus. And because, oh my my hands, <laughs> because my hands were otherwise occupied, I landed on my head. And, and basically I had a, a mild fractured skull. And wow. uh, when, I, when I came round, 
I had, I'd lost my memory and I lost speech, basically. And I, I spent quite a few months with a, a speech therapist in London. And it was the initial, the initial sessions with speech therapists. She would show me, she would show me the photograph of, say, a dog, okay? And I had to respond to what I thought it was. And in the very early days, I'd be just as likely to see a wolf, i.e. something that was quite similar, mm. or a cat, something totally opposite, or even log, which was just through sound. And once I'd recovered, it, that's what poetry is. It's, it's, using, it's using oppositions, metaphors, sound, to try and, try and ex, ex, express yourself. And so that was, that was my second way into it, really, was just, uh, I thought language is, is both very, very important, but very fluid and flexible as well. Uh, and uh, yeah. So yeah. that's how I started writing. The animals, again, came in from a, from a more, from a poetic side. It was just the poets that uh, influenced me when I first started writing. People like Ted Hughes, uh, Seamus Heaney, who wrote quite a bit about animals. I could certainly get into them. Uh, and that's, that's where it came from for me, yeah. I was curious if anyone's listening to this or watching this and they say, right, that's it. I'm going to start writing poems tonight. Um, I have my pen and my paper and I'm ready to go. Um, and they want to sort of maybe get inspired by your approach of looking at uh, images of animals, specifically individuals of other species. Do you have any... I guess these would be quite general tips, <laughs> but do you have any tips for them or do you have any sort of words of wisdom or anything that you'd like to, to pass on uh, in some way uh, for motivation, inspiration, anything? I think again, when you're starting, the, the present tense is quite a good one to use, I think as well, because it, it gets you right into what you're writing about. And when I talked about these associations that are coming in, using the five senses as well, I'm just using, I never get, I never rem remember them all when I talk about them. But, you know, sight, sound, smell, taste, etc. So, so the poems, are, the, the words are very grounded in that way. Um, try to be, uh, try to be specific. Don't, don't try to be too abstract. I think that's, that's important. I think, yeah. If poetry is abstract, then it can be, it can be difficult, if you like. If it's dealing with ideas most of the time, and that's when I think people find poetry quite difficult to, to take in or to write, really. Uh, but if you if you can find something something that captures your attention, is very important. And, and then, as I say, using using the five senses to try and describe it. Description is a good a good good way to start as well. Just trying to describe something as well as you can. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to everyone who's who's joined us to listen to these wonderful poems and this conversation with Gordon. Um, we will put um, links to Gordon's work in the description. And the poems that were read today were from the Zoo Speak volume that came out in 2020. So we'll make sure to link that one as well so that you can check out the images and the poems yourself too. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. and. From myself and Tiamat, thank you for joining us with The Shifting Lens. Thank you. I look forward to hearing it. Cheers. <laughs>